Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to talk again to Professor John J. Collins. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, as viewers probably know, John is the uh, home, Holmes Professor of Old Testament Criticism and Interpretation Emeritus, I believe, um, at Yale right. Divinity School. Yeah, it's emeritus now. Um, he is noted for his research in the Hebrew Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls and their relation to Christian origins. Today, John has kindly, very kindly agreed to talk to us about the violence in the Bible, in both the Hebrew Bible and the Christian New Testament, because it's in both. Now, John has written a book called Does the Bible Justify Violence, where he reviews the passages in the Bible describing violence done by God, commanded or promised by God, done by people, as well as those texts that have been used by Jews and Christians throughout history. For example, he discusses the Exodus and the conquest of the Canaanites in the book of Joshua as two sides of the same coin. The Exodus, the Exodus story has inspired hope for millennia, as well as civil rights movements. At the same time, people identifying with the liberated Israel supported by God have cited the conquest. This is the, the conquest of the promised land to justify actions ranging from genocide of indigenous peoples to apartheid. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 10 to 19, there is mention of offering peace to peoples of distant cities. Now, I want to read this passage because um, I think it gives a flavor of the issues uh, that we are going to discuss. It says Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse, verses 10 onwards, which read, When you draw near to a town to fight against it, offer it terms of peace. If it accepts your terms of peace and surrenders to you, then all the people in it shall serve you in forced labor. If it does not submit to you peacefully, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God gives it into your hand, you shall put all its males to the sword. You may, however, take as your booty the women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the town, all its spoil. You may enjoy the spoil of your enemies, which the Lord your God has given you. Thus, you shall treat all the towns that are very far from you, which are not towns of the nations here. But as for the nations, as for the towns of these people that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, you must not let anything that breathes remain alive. You shall annihilate them, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jeb Jebusites, just as the Lord your God has commanded, so that they may not teach you to do all the abhorrent things that they do for their gods and you thus sin against the Lord your God. So that's Deuteronomy 20. Now, this requirement to kill all the all human beings, men, women, children, including animals, known as ban or harem, or it's a bit like the Arabic haram, is found in several places in the Hebrew Bible. And another passage in Deuteronomy is found in Joshua and in 1 Samuel 15, verse 3, a famous passage there. So if I may perhaps begin by asking the following question, uh, John. And now I understand that it's generally believed by scholars that these stories associated with the conquest of the promised land are not historical. This is the, the overwhelming consensus of the scholars. But putting aside the issue of the historicity of these wholesale extermination of foreign nations, if the biblical canon emerged as a his, in, in a historical setting in which Israel was weak and under foreign domination, how do we explain the presence of such texts in the Hebrew Bible? Even if these claims are deemed to be exaggerated uh, and are unlikely to represent historical reality, why have them in the Bible? Would their presence not have made it more difficult for the Jewish people to live under foreign domination? I would say that they are in the Bible as compensation. 
precisely because they couldn't do it to the Assyrians or the Babylonians, it was nice to imagine that they could have done it to the Canaanites. Gosh. Now, you know, I'm sure there was a certain amount of slaughter yeah. in the development of early Israel. It's just that, you know, the, the dramatic stories like the capture of Jericho do not seem to have happened to the mm. best of our present knowledge. Mm. Um, but you know, there was lots of tribal warfare. And this practice of the ban was not peculiar to Israel. Uh, uh, we know the Moabites have there's a, a Moabite inscription that boasts of it. This was a great act of devotion to, to the God of Moab wow. to slaughter Israelites. So, you know, those things went around. But I think in large part, you see, the, the book of Deuteronomy is a very interesting book because in some ways it's very humanistic. Mm. But, but in other ways, it is um, post-colonial mimicry. Oh. Uh, you know, that after the Assyrians, now the Assyrians were brutal in their mm. warfare. Now, after the Assyrian domination, this is partly the manifesto of Judean independence. And they are saying in some parts of it, and we can be like the Assyrians too. Mm. And our God can be like the God of the Assyrians. Now, you know, we may like to think that our religion is above that kind of thing, but not necessarily so. You know, uh, the Bible and religion generally are largely about identity formation. Mm. And that's certainly what Deuteronomy was up to. It was trying to form the identity of a people. And it, they, it was trying to demand the kind of allegiance to the God of Israel that the king of Assyria demanded. Right. Now, I mean, that's an ambivalent thing enough. Mm. Uh, because it's kind of casting the God of Israel in the mold of the uh, king and the gods of Assyria. Mm. Now, that's not the whole story in Deuteronomy, but it's an ingredient. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I'm on the subject, I might mention um, a quite interesting book by a compatriot of mine, Stephen Moore, mm -hmm. New Testament scholar. Right. Taught, taught in the UK early in his career and then has been, been over here um, on uh, the book of Revelation in a post-colonial perspective. Oh, right. Because again, you know, it gives you God as emperor mm. and not at all shy about using brutal force mm. to destroy his enemies in the end of the day. And this, again, I think was largely compensation. You know, it was not something the Christians at that time could do. I would think there was very, very little violence by Christians at mm. the end of the first century. Yeah. For the very simple reason, they couldn't. They didn't have any power. They, they were completely, they were the other, the, the lowest possible end of the social, social order. So, yeah. But, but when they got it, <laughs> they compensated in other ways. <laughs> yes, yes. That's so, yeah, that's human nature. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my, uh, my next question sort of follows on uh, from that. The ethics of ban or harem, this is the complete extermination, devotion of uh, peoples to, to, to their God, seem completely at odds with our modern ethics and appear to stand out even when viewed historically. Because while large scale killings have occurred in societies throughout history, rarely, it seems, have there been attempts to wipe out or make extinct an entire community. We can think of the Nazis who attempted to eliminate the Jewish community completely, of course. And in more recently, the extremist um, Hutus in Rwanda who aimed to exterminate the Tutsis. Yes. In, both, in both cases, Children and infants were not spared because the goal was to put a complete and permanent end to a particular community. Is there material in the Hebrew Bible, and this is coming to the question really, which can be used to support the notion of peaceful coexistence of Israelites and non-Israelites in the same land? And if not, 
what may be the way forward for a believer who accepts the Bible as scripture? Well, first of all, let me say, you know, it may not be so much at odds with present day thinking as we would like to believe. Look at what's happening in the Ukraine. Mm. And in large part, it seems that Vladimir Putin would like to erase Ukrainian identity as a separate thing. I think that's what Antiochus Epiphanes was trying to do to the Jews back in the, the you know, more than 2,000 years ago. It happened closer to home for both of us, you know, with England and Ireland. Mm. Uh, and, you know, that this kind of thing goes on. But to get back to your question, yes, there are some resources. The pity of it is they're not all that numerous. Right. But there are, there are some nice ones. Right. Think, for example, of the Book of Ruth. Yes. It's a lovely story. Mm. Lovely story. You know, where Ruth is the, Moab, the good Moabitess. Yes. And uh, the Book of Jonah, huh. where, uh, you know, Jonah is angry because he's afraid God will forgive the Assyrians. <laughs> And, you know, these are some of the counter voices mm. in the Hebrew Bible. And, of course, in the New Testament, I think the historical Jesus, and by the historical Jesus, I mean pretty much Jesus as he's portrayed in the Synoptic Gospels, mm. you know, is a voice of reconciliation and peace. Mm. Well, we'll come to that That's because there are... There is some rhetoric of violence uh, on the lips of Jesus as portrayed in the synoptics as well. Um, but um, just coming to that, that's the, the, my next question. Um, the divinely sanctioned violence is um, absent in the New Testament. This is understandable given the very different historical context the New Testament is obviously written in. However, Jesus seems to return with a vengeance in his second coming in the book of Revelation. Can you elaborate upon Jesus' second career in Revelation? Is this more in line with the divinely sanctioned violence of the Hebrew Bible? It most certainly is. Hmm. Now, you know, at the moment, I'm, I'm teaching a class as a post, as an emeritus professor, and I'm doing it on the Messiah, which we talked about before. Now, uh, you know, the standard expectation of the Messiah yeah. uh, in this period was a militant figure. Bar Kokhba fitted the profile to perfection. You know, brave man, stand up to the Romans, fight. Now, Jesus did not fit that mold at all. Mm. But once he was out of the way, uh, his followers reshaped him. And he would not be the last person that that would happen to, I think, in history. Mm -hmm. you know, that that uh, people have a way of shaping their heroes to make them conform to what they think they should have said. Mm. or they should have, have done. It's very, very hard to reconcile the book of Revelation with the teaching of Jesus as you get it in the parables. Mm. Mm. Now, I should say, I like the book of Revelation. I think it's great stuff. <laughs> there, there is very expressive language in there. Uh, I could imagine somebody in the Ukraine reading it and get, getting a certain amount of you know, comfort from it at the moment. Um, but it's a different mindset. Hmm. But here, here Jesus slaughters his enemies. Uh, I mean, there's great carnage on an industrial yeah. scale, on a cosmic scale, um, which, you know, is no, no longer Mr. Nice Guy of the Synoptic Gospels. Here is, uh, you know, as you say, much of an Old Testament uh, image of Yahweh who is, uh, you know, a general of, of genocide on occasions, and it just well, seemed to fit, very, uh, ill fit together. Are you familiar with Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor? I am. Yes, I've, I've read the Brothers Karamazov, yes. And uh, the, the Grand Inquisitor, you know, when, when Jesus comes back, says, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, and it's not that he doesn't recognize him, it's that he does recognize him. 
Yeah, and yeah. He, it's, you, know, you caused enough trouble when you were here before. And it took us centuries to get this straightened out <laughs> and get things back to the way they ought to be. So please go back where you came from. Uh, now, you know, I think the, the author of Revelation felt that he and his community needed something very different from love your enemies. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, coming back to the Jesus Synoptic Gospel, I was going to challenge this idea that he is this peace-loving, pacifist, mm-hmm. turn-the-other-cheek figure. Because, there, I mean, for a start, famously, uh, one of the biggest events that is in all, of the, all four of the Gospel, the cleansing of the temple, um, is arguably a violent act, allegedly. So he goes into the temple in Jerusalem, he upsets the, the, the tables, the money changes, he gets out a whip and starts whipping people. I mean, this is not um, a pacifist. This is a man who is taking militant action of a very yes. physical, violent kind. So, now, remind I, I, me, <laughs> how many people did he kill? Oh, not that. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, yes, it is violent, but it's not violence on the scale of the book of Revelation. True. Not anything close to it. No. Uh, but, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't wish to suggest that the historical Jesus was a total nonviolent pacifist. Nor indeed would I want to suggest that I would subscribe to pacifism myself. Right. You know, there are times that call for it. And I think, again, as we speak, uh, for the people of the Ukraine, I would have no compunction for that. But if somebody, in, I think somebody in Russia could do a good deed to humanity by a little violence directed in the right quarters. <laughs> but uh, uh, so, you know, if I'm not, um, I, I, I would not want to make this business of turning the other cheek into an absolute. Right. No. You know, that that is a difficult saying. It's one actually I, I discuss a bit and agonize over in the, my more recent book, ah, What Are Biblical good. Values? Good. What are biblical values? Can you, sorry, could you hold that up again, uh, John, just so we can see the cover? Thank you. Uh, John Rickard, what about what the Bible says on key ethical issues? Thank you. Yeah, That's excellent. It. And I spend a little more time on the New Testament in that. The, um, the book you refer to at the beginning was mm. actually a lecture. It was the presidential address to the Society of Biblical Literature oh. in 2001, right, right after 9-11. Wow, yeah. And the, what I was trying to do was I thought there were a lot of people at the time who were saying, oh, what a horrible religion Islam is. Mm-hmm. They're so violent. And I thought it would be salutary to remind people of the wellsprings of violence in our own tradition. Mm, yeah. Dude, before because we get to... Sorry, carry on. I'm going to interrupt you. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I was just saying, before we uh, get to... Um, you mentioned Islam. I'll come back to a second. But I just wanted to, just to further comment on the, uh, the Gospels. Um, I mentioned the cleansing of the temple. But there's also the, the, the language of violence against oneself... Um, in the Sermon on the Mount, for mm-hmm. example, Matthew chapter 5, where uh, Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. If your, if your hand causes you to mm-hmm. sin, cut it off. Now, um, usually today people explain that away and saying, oh, well, that's just um, a bit of hyperbole. It's a kind of yes. Semitic kind of rhetoric. But there were some very prominent Christians in history who took it literally, like or- or Origen, allegedly, uh, the early biblical scholar and there will always be people arguably some people um who will take it literally even if it's not meant to be taken literally and um it will be an invitation to violence against self Uh, i mean well what's going on there how do you interpret these these kind of uh violent uh images that on the lips of well i do take those ones as hyperbole and uh, it, it, what it's saying, I think, is there are some things for which you should have zero tolerance. Hmm. And this, this is a nice, colorful way of saying it. Hmm. Now, you know, whether zero tolerance, in fact, is, is something to be endorsed without any qualification is something we may talk about. Because it does show, you know, that Jesus was not without zeal. 
Uh, there was a book about 10 years ago called The Zealot. And I'm not thinking now oh. of the author's name, uh, uh, but... Oh, the, the, um, the American writer, um, is he a Muslim yeah. writer? Yes, that's right. Yeah, Aslan, Aslan, um, Aslan, I think his name was. I can't remember his first. Yeah, Uh, I know you mean. Yeah, he's a professor of writing, I think, in the West Coast. Um, Yeah, his his work is quite based heavily based on um, Giza Vermesh, I think, and uh, E.P. Sanders and people like that. Yeah, but I think uh, pushing it a bit. You know, I think to make Jesus into a zealot with a capital Z is is an exaggeration. Hmm. But at the same time, to to have an exaggeration, to have an effective exaggeration, you need to have a little grain of the truth there. (laughs) And so evidently Jesus was not, hey, Jesus wasn't an anything goes kind of person. Hmm. You know, I, and and I think you know it's very hard to stand for anything in the world uh, without having some little degree of violence, and that. But what we ought to be trying to do isn't so much eradicate violence as control it. Hmm. Mm. Interesting. But I mean, talking about controlling violence, just there. I mean, is there such a thing as a biblical ethic when it comes to warfare? In Islam, coming to that in a second, there is quite a developed theory of just of just war. There are rules of war. So, you know, there are hadith that speak of not um, uh, killing uh, non-combatants, women, children, monks, the elderly, and so on, not cutting down trees and so on. Is there a, a, any um, kind of biblical war ethic, rules of war that we can allude to? There's a little bit, and you know where you get it? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. <laughs> I knew you'd say yes. that. <laughs> uh, and specifically this bit about not cutting down trees. Yes, and that's actually in the you same chapter. Uh, the very same chapter, 2022. I didn't read I'll read it. I didn't read it because um, it wasn't yeah. germane to uh, our point. Um, uh, but anyway, it, it is in that chapter about not cutting down trees because uh, – you know, they're not done you any harm, basically. They're not going to... That's right. And you. If, you take, if you take a woman captive, there mm. are some limits to what you may do for her. Mm. Mm. If you, to her, I mean, they're not the limits of the Me Too movement by yeah. any means, but, but there are some limits. Mm. Mm. You know, there, there's at least some consciousness that you are, in fact, dealing here. Your enemy is also a human being. Mm. Uh, and uh, you also have the bit, you know, if you see your enemy's ass going astray, you should take it back. So th- there are little things like that, but th- there are qualifications. And I would think, you see, that uh, daily life in ancient Israel and ancient Judah was probably not so different in how people related to each other. In village life, wherever you happen to be, people have to get along by and large. Mm. And then it's the uh, the ideologues come in and paint the broader picture. Right. Now, you know, it's often commented, this list of people like the, the Hittites and the Girgashites who mm. were to be annihilated in Deuteronomy, they were long gone before the time of Deuteronomy. Right. So it's, it's easy to hate them. It's easy to exterminate them. But at the same time, you see, uh, it's dangerous because uh, if you, you get a zealot in the pulpit that can get worked up and identify the Girgashites in their midst mm. and go after them. And there's there's no also the, the Amalekites, the, the Amalek, uh, who yes. almost become like a trope through our Christian and yes. Jewish history yes. in the last 2,000 years. And particularly uh, um, going into t- talking about the, the the people of Ukraine being under military occupation and under military attack, um, if you think of the Palestinians uh, in the occupied territories uh, who have uh, been under attack, and one of the tropes used by some Zionists is the the, the Amalek, this very concept, the Amalekites, and the, yeah. identified as the Palestinians. Now, why this matters, of course, is the Amalekites, according to the biblical story were targeted for extermination. Uh, they were to be ethnically cleansed from the land. And, and this, this, this Amalek or the Amalekites is a recurring theme, it's also in Christian history, when the other has been, uh, in, in North America, uh, actually, where you are, uh, the, the, uh, 
the indigenous people of ha- those lands. Ha- been- another Sorry? refer Sorry. to the Native Americans as this Amal- this Amalek uh, annoying us. So who, who was that person? I didn't. Sorry, I was. Speak- what, what, who was Cotton the- Mather, right? Who's a famous Puritan preacher, right? So yeah, that is very much with us now. You know, one of the ways that some Israelis have tried to deal with this, mm. and I'm thinking here of a man, a scholar named Moshe Greenberg, great scholar, is now deceased, um, but he said, you know, laws are specific. You should you. Eliminate the Girgashites and, and the Amalekites, but they're not there anymore. Mm. You know, you know, you can stop now. That's been done. But the, the trouble with that, and I, you know, I do appreciate that that was well intentioned and perhaps even effective <laughs> in its context. But the problem with it is, uh, if you're going to use the scripture that way, you can't use it at all. Mm. Scripture lives by analogical application. Mm. You know, if the story of the Good Samaritan is to have any appeal to us, it's got to apply to people who aren't Samaritans at all. Yes, because well, there are Samaritans, of course, around, but they're, they're, they're very few and located in the Middle East. There are not many Samaritans in Norway or in uh, right. Chile or something. But, uh, yeah. um, but, but isn't this the problem? Because y- you can historicize this issue by saying, these are historical examples. They don't exist anymore. There are no Samaritans in these other places. But that's not how conservative or traditional people see the script. Right. They, I mean, I'm, I'm holding the new Revised Standard Version here. On the cover, it says Holy Bible. It, it, it is a holy mm-hmm. book. It is a mm-hmm. word of God, actual word of God. And therefore, it transcends mere historical particularity from thousands of years ago. It is relevant, particularly in America, where you get... Even now, the book of Revelation is constantly being referred to, or refers to Putin, or before it was Saddam Hussein, or before that it was Hitler, before that it was whoever. You know, it constantly reinvents itself in a very contemporary way and speaks powerfully, yeah. is believed, to that contemporary situation in a completely unhistorical manner. It, it, so just linking it back to the past and saying, remain in the past, O text, you know, don't, don't leap into the present. Yeah is not going to work with these people because they see the Bible differently as a, as a divine revelation, a living word, not just an historical text. That's right. And, you know, I think they're not wrong to see it as a living text. That's the way scripture ought to be used. Well, then we have a problem but because the trouble is that, they that become alive and they're used that, to uh, yes, kill and, people. And, and uh, you know, scripture is a two-edged sword. Quoting Hebrew. That's why one, one has to, yes, one has to use it uh, mm. rather carefully. Um, yeah, I think it was Walter Benjamin said that every great monument of culture is also a monument to what atrocity or barbarism. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. So, so g- given that scripture can be quite easily appropriated and used to other eyes, Groups would be their Palestinians, obviously, or groups of the Tutsis in Africa, or the Native Americans in what is now the United States, who are systematically uh, targeted by what are now would now be called evangelical Christians, the Puritans, uh, mm-hmm. anachronistically. Yeah. Uh, they're using the Bible as mainstream Christians. Uh, you know that these these are uh, you know evangelicals are mainstream Christians, and I could, yeah. I could talk about Catholics, of course, historically in South America. I mean, the list is actually very, very long. Um, well, look, if everybody does it when mm. it's to their advantage. <laughs> I mean, every group, not every individual in the group, mm. but, but nobody is innocent mm. of this, I think. So, and I, I think I, it's just important to realize that. You know, it's not the case that we have the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Mm. And it's not the case that we have the morally pure message and nothing but. Mm. You know, what, what we have has a lot of potential for good, and it also has a lot of potential for damage. Mm. I think uh, if, if one reads it, I mean, as a more Catholic view, I suppose, if one reads these scriptures in an ecclesial context, uh, as you have done within the Catholic communion, then th- that that puts an interpretive framework uh, 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 on the scriptures. Well, one's not just 
applying texts from Deuteronomy to the Palestinians. You know, what, what one is reading it through the prism of the, the church, its traditions, the magisterium, the papal teaching. And so you get a, a, a more um, nuanced uh, reading, should we say, than a... And, and this is also what uh, Moshe Greenberg was trying to do with the Jewish tradition. Right. And th this would be very true of, of Judaism. You know, it's, it's really the, the rabbis that, that carry the authority. And I think it's also true of Islam, mm. although in all three traditions, people can get around the tradition when they want to mm. oh, yeah. uh, on occasion. But still, it's on the whole a salutary thing, mm. but it doesn't remove the problem entirely mm. Mm. because the traditions aren't always innocent either. Mm. Okay. Well, coming to this, my, my, my next question really is, um, I want to quote uh, from uh, Dr. Andy Bannister, who's a British uh, evangelical yeah. uh, writer, uh, scholar. Um, and in a recent apologetic work, uh, we informed that, and quoting him, the characteristic of Yahweh that he is, that he is a God of love. This is Andy Bannister. Yep. Do Muslims and Christians worship the same God? InterVarsity Press, just last year, 2021, page 61. That's what he says. Now, even if we restrict ourselves to the ban or haram texts, this statement seems questionable. I'm sure you'd agree, because God surely did not display any love towards the exterminated non-Israelite communities. Besides this, is it not the case that God's love throughout the Hebrew Bible seems to be conditional upon the observance of his commands. We observe this, for example, in Leviticus 26, where God spells out the punishment for those who disobey his commandments. And interestingly, even in John's gospel in the New Testament, God's love for humanity caused him to give his only sons, John 3.16, famously. But a restriction is immediately introduced in verses 16 to 18. The one who does not believe stands condemned. And for the author of 1 John in the New Testament, God is love. But those who are not righteous are denied the status of being God's children. Mm -hmm. They are the children of the devil. That's 1 John 3.10. 3, yeah. So how would you describe the theme of God's love in the Bible? It surely seems like a more complicated and conditional concept than one would believe from um, at least Andy Bannister's presentation of the Christian view. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, now, you know, very often it is love for this religious community. Mm. And now that there's a long debate about this business of love your neighbor as yourself, mm. which is, after all, in Leviticus, mm. in a book that's very much preoccupied with purity and drawing clean lines between Jew and Gentile and so forth. And uh, I don't doubt that in its original context, it meant love your fellow Israelite. Right. That that's what it meant is and together. And I think by extension, there is the assumption that God loves us mm. more than he loves anybody else. Now, I don't think the New Testament really breaks with that. I mean, as I read the historical Jesus, I think he was, in fact, trying to break with that. Um, but you also have the same debate, you know, about the, um, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, who's 25 or 26, you know, the sheep and the goats passage. Right. Yes. And uh, again, who are the least of these, you know, that you are to be good to? And many people think it's the members of the Christian community. Oh, right. yeah. oh, again, yeah. I don't think that was actually what Jesus meant by it. Mm. I, I think Jesus was rather non-denominational that way. Mm. Uh, but but it's, it's very common. So, I mean, uh, is God a God of love? Yes. Is God a God of anger? Absolutely, all over the place. Uh, is God a God of hatred on occasion? You will find passages that would support that. Mm. And so, you know, God is a complex and well-rounded character in the Bible. And mm. yes, uh, there is love. There is also, but also, you know, he has a huge anger management problem. Mm. Uh, 
you know, especially in the Hebrew Bible, but also, you know, in the, think of the book of Revelation, but also in all of the Gospels, even the Synoptic Gospels, there's a scene where the Son of Man will come in the clouds of heaven, and uh, it gets pretty violent there too. So, you know, but now, you see, uh, I mean, what, how do we say anything about God? Hmm. <laughs> and I, I would submit, you know, there are basically two things. That on the one hand, God, we think God is the power behind that which is. Mm, yeah. So this is, if you like, revelation in history. So what's happening now in the Ukraine is, in a sense, an act of God. What happened with, the, with Hitler was, in a sense, an act of God, if you look at it that way. Now, Against that, and over against it, there is this um, impulse to say that God is good and that God stands for everything that we as human beings think of as good. And there's a beautiful passage on this in the book of Hosea, chapter 11, where uh, God is angry with Ephraim and is thinking of destroying it, and then he remembers Ephraim as a child and teaching it to walk. And then he gets all warm and tender and says, no, I am God and not man. I will not come to destroy. But of course he did come and destroy Samaria, or somebody did, and, and presumably with divine authority. But I think, you see, again, if you think of what we say about God as a venture in humans trying to make sense of our experience, uh, then you, you can't be surprised that there are contradictory impulses. Mm. And then we have to decide what are the more important impulses and which ones should we encourage and which ones should we try to tame. If on the other hand, you know, you think that this is being handed down on Mount Sinai, well, then it gets pretty confusing. Because this is, is not a God who has it all together, so to speak. And there's also this, if I may be slightly cynical for a second, <laughs> when we look at the, uh, the teaching of Jesus in the synoptics, okay, we get a, a message very often of peace and inclusion, yeah. of love, etc. You mentioned this, the parable of the Good Samaritan. But, and this is the cynical thing here, at the same time, he's also preaching, uh, as you alluded to briefly, in the parable of the sheep and the goats and the return of the Son of Man on the clouds of glory, bringing judgment. He seems to be saying he, he has the ability to preach peace and tolerance and so on, but precisely because at the back of his mind, he believes God's going to come in and do the violence. Yes. He's going to do sort out. He's going to separate. He's going to send some people to heaven and other people to hell where they will burn in hell forever. You know, Matthew 25 yes. stuff. So really, we, we you know, he, he's being like this because he is just relying that this deity will come in and do that. So yeah. anyway, so he doesn't have to be violent because God's going to do the violence and he's going to expect God to intervene. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. pretty soon to do that. So it's kind of this interesting kind of dynamic going on here. It's not just the peace. It's also the peace. But, yeah, God's going to do it for me. God's going to do the, the violence, in fact, not me. I'm not going to preach it, but God's going to do it. Would that be a too cynical way of portraying it? I don't think so. I mean, I think that's <laughs> bang on, actually. And, you know, I think it's also a, a real moral problem for Christianity and for all the major religions, uh, that if you take away that idea of a final judgment, mm. you know, on what do you base your moral instruction? Now, you know, I think a lot of the teaching of Jesus isn't actually based on the final judgment. No, I think no. a lot of it is appealing to a sense of fellow humanity. Mm, mm. But it's very hard for people to get by without the idea of an enforcer coming in. And the brute fact, as we're being reminded again at the moment, is that if there isn't an enforcer, some people will misbehave. Some mm. people will take advantage of the situation. Mm -hmm. 
and 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 obviously you're alluding to the president of Russia, who is actually a Christian. Yeah. Uh, he's an Orthodox. Oh yeah. You you, you often yes, see and, it in, and, in cathedrals, and, kissing icons and praying um, before and the. Quite uh, well liked in among Russian Orthodox. Yeah. But Ukraine is also a Christian country, um, yeah. uh, Orthodox uh, as well. So we have this is, uh, in a religious sense, a Christian country, a Christian leader attacking another Christian country uh, as we speak, it seems. And not for the first time. No. No, 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 unfortunately, probably the last time. <laughs> well, I don't think we're solving any problems. For no, I, this here. is most unsatisfactory. <laughs> 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 but, but no, what we're doing is perhaps, uh, as they say, clarifying issues um, and uh, trying, clarifying yeah, the to problematize things. Yes, recognizing the paradoxical uh, or contradictory nature of the, the sources that we're looking yes. at, um, which is kind of a, a good exercise because it frees us from illusions and uh, and alerts us to problems, and so we can avoid taking the Amalekites, uh, hopefully, as um, paradigmatic. Uh, yeah. or exemplars. Uh, unfortunately, you know, Paul says in is it one one Timothy three sixteen, all Scripture is God breathed, and he's referring only to the Jew. Uh, I would say I don't agree to the the Jewish scriptures uh, rather than the New Testament, which hadn't obviously been written then. All Scripture is God breathed and is useful and profitable for training in righteousness, as an example in teaching us mm -hmm. how to. So you're straight back into that, saying, Ah, right, what did God do with the in Deuteronomy, what did he do? Blah blah blah. So it's kind of hardwired to some extent. This problem. If you take the Greek of that passage quite literally, it's saying it's not just all scripture; it's all writing. Is God breathed? Now you get into some problems with that one. Hmm. Wasn't he alluding to the Bible, though? I mean, the Jewish scriptures. Well, he was, he was, I know. Yeah. But, but for all of that, you know, if you wanted to be a deconstructionist and oh, to, to push <laughs> the meaning of the words, that Graffe had not yet really acquired the, the meaning of sacred scripture. Yes, we're running our well, writings, Graffe. That's, that's yeah. literally what it means. Where we get to, yeah. literally writing. Yeah, but you wouldn't yeah. want to defend that. No, no, that, that doesn't, that's not to go there. Okay. Um, well, finally, I understand you'll be giving a lecture on this very subject, the, the violence in the Bible or biblical violence. Uh, is that yes. right? In the new well, yeah. the, this is actually in a class at Holy Cross College in Worcester. Right. And uh, a professor of classics, uh, whom I knew in graduate school, is having his students read the pa passage from the Jewish War. Ah, by Josephus. Yes. And so the, the focus of what I'm going to talk about in that will be later. It will really start more with the Maccabees. Right. And the dilemma of violence. Hmm. Because, as in now, you know, I have a good deal of respect for the Maccabees. Hmm. Uh, the Maccabees were successful revolutionaries. Hmm. You know. For a period. They, and for a time. For a period. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, for a hundred years or so. And for that reason, they won respect. Mm -hmm. Zeal, you know, was accredited. And I think this tends to be the case wherever you have a successful revolution. Mm -hmm. You might quibble as to what actually caused the success of it. But uh, I think if there was violence... And if it succeeded, at least to a degree, then you will have a strong tendency to say, and that's what we should do again. Mm. I think, you know, this is probably true of the Irish Republican Army. Mm. That there was enough success 100 years ago mm. to accredit this. And uh, it would be certainly true in Israel, too, of some people. But I think it's... True, quite commonly. Mm. But then, of course, you get into a situation when you're fighting against Rome. Mm. And this is what Josephus saw, is this becomes totally disastrous. Yeah. You know, it becomes a recipe for annihilation. And what you will often find in a time like that is that people will then go off and write things like the book of Revelation. Mm. Uh, not necessarily involving Jesus in it, but that there were plenty of similar books at the time, you know, fantasizing about God coming 
to wreak the vengeance that we would like to wreak, but we aren't quite able to pull it off. Gosh, yes. And now, and you know, that in itself is also a very interesting phenomenon. And I think there was a lot of this uh, on the other side in Northern Ireland in the mm. trouble, <clears throat> a lot of, you know, fundamentalist preaching mm. that invoked biblical tropes that were quite violent without actually saying, and you should go and do likewise. I think of Reverend Ian Paisley, for example, who is, uh, his son is yes. still very active in politics. And of course, he was a fiery Christian preacher. Uh, he oh, never yes. took up arms, but you're, you're, you're implying that his rhetoric, however, sure. um, incited people, yeah. perhaps. Some of us think Donald Trump took a page out of his book. Oh, really? <laughs> but again, you know, you have the same problem now with the inquiry into the uh, the riots of the Capitol right. on January 6th. Uh, is somebody responsible if he didn't actually say go out and do this? Mm. But he said a lot of things that uh, would lead you to think that it would be a good thing to do that. So it's kind of indirect well, that, complicity rather than uh, direct, not, yeah. not direct. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, you always end up with ambivalence. Mm. Because I think those fantasies give people hope in a situation where there is no hope. That's their selling point. That's the thing about the book of Revelation. It's really, you know, for the oppressed. Yes. And in that case, it's, it's important and vital, you know, to believe that somewhere, sometime, justice will be done. Mm -hmm. and, and justice is not reconciliation in this way of looking no. at it. No. So, uh, but then, you know, you've got to balance that with then uh, the impulse to, to help God out, you know, to go to come to the help of the Lord, as it says in the book of Judges. And, and uh, just in case the Lord is a little bit late, we can get things underway. Yeah. <laughs> Blow up the Temple Mount or whatever. <laughs> yes, yes. I can see lots of Jewish preachers in the first century who were trying to force God's hand by, uh, um, by whatever actions that they, yeah, yeah, to promote God. Yeah, I know, unfortunately, uh, often had terrible consequences, but... Um, Okay, well, um, well, thank you very much indeed uh, for that fascinating, um, a brief perhaps uh, tour around some of the biblical stories and the complexities, paradoxes, contradictions, uh, and agonizing choices that we must make um, in in reading uh, the scriptures um, and the unresolved. I get a sense of unresolved tensions in the scriptural narratives and the unresolved issues that we have to live with because it's our human condition and. Um, yeah, but uh, thank you very much indeed for that. And um, best wishes for the, your, your upcoming talk on this subject. Yeah. And um, I hope if we do speak again, the uh, by that time, the Ukrainian situation will be over. And um, I hope so. I hope so. All right. Well, thank you very much, sir. And until okay. next time. Thank you, Paul. Bye. Okay. Bye bye.